Yesterday we were talking about what I call non-linguistic Torah, understanding that isn't based on explicit statements, rules, sources, analysis, theory, argument, evidence, proof. Um, and I, I mentioned this is a big subject, a big subject in philosophy. It's, it pervades all of life. But I want to give you a few more examples of how this works in um, in Torah understanding and how it applies. <clears throat> As I said, I think this is part of the background to this sort of understanding of the, the Hasidic movement. Um, the Ramban wrote a work against the Balama Or. Um, Or challenged the Rif in his analysis of Gemara and in his Psak based on the Gemara. And it was Kazama the Kwasi Lever because the Rif for 150 years had been the big authority. And the Balam Or was young and he took issue with the Rif quite, um, how shall I say, quite positively. So the Ramban wrote a sefer called Machamos Hashem, the Wars of God to defend the riff against the Balamor. <clears throat> he says in the introduction, anyone who has studied Talmud and, and tried to understand it knows that if you have an issue that you want to settle on the basis of the sources in the Talmud, it's not going to be glot. It's not going to be simple and clear and consistent and obvious. It's not going to be that way. Some of the sources will clearly support you, and some of the sources will seem to be against you, and some of the sources will be equivocal, could be touched one way or another way, and you'll have to explain your position, and you'll have to explain why you think the ones that look like they're against you really aren't against you, and you'll be weighing up arguments for it, arguments against, and making a judgment as to which arguments are stronger. And since it's that kind of an analysis, which can't sign mathematics, <clears throat> there's room for differences of opinion. And the difference of opinion will sometimes rely on weighing up which arguments are stronger, weighing up which interpretations of passages are what we call dochak, they're too unnatural to be accepted, and you have this in the Gemara as well. For example, you'll have a Mishnah. Someone will bring a Mishnah to prove something. And someone will respond, Mishabashtahi. Mishabashta literally means it's all mixed up. And what it means in practice is, the words that you have in your text of the Mishnah can't be right. They can't be right because they're too unintelligible. We have to assume that the transmission of the Mishnah was, was um, not done accurately and that we do not have the original text of the Mishnah. This is a Mishnah, Bryce, or whatever it is. <coughs> and then when you try to recover the original, try to repair the words you have to make them more reasonable, then often what it says is, okay, you agree that it was Mishabashta. You agree that the transmission wasn't accurate. You fixed it this way and used your fix to support your point. But once you have to fix it, I can fix it differently. So it's a to support my point, since we don't have the original. Now, the question should be raised, how could an Amora say about something that was produced by the Tanoim, let's say 200 years before, that it's Meshavashta? Why doesn't he say, they were great holy people we can't come to their toenails. We can't imagine what was going on in their minds. It's right and we don't understand it. And they don't say that. But they say it's Mishabashti. It's wrong. The words we have are wrong. And not only that, but there's a difference of standards. Rav and Abai in particular disagree about this a number of times in Shas. What kind of change in the wording will you tolerate as having been made by accident and what not? If it's going to change the whole meaning of the Mishnah, the whole outcome of the Mishnah, one says that's too big a change to tolerate that took place by an accidental forgetting or misunderstanding. 
and therefore it's not credible to say that that's what happened. And he says, no, it is. It is credible. Now, these are not things that you can prove with precise proofs. You have a sense of the people who wrote the Mishnah. You know, you know the material they were talking about. You know the limits beyond which uh, positions can't go without becoming unintelligible. And you know the kinds of breakdowns that happen when people transmit a lot of uh, material, especially when it's uh, a period of time when it's oral. And you make a judgment call as to whether it's plausible to say that this was the original Mishnah or wasn't the original Mishnah. These types of judgments are matters of evaluation and um, can't be justified on the basis of appeal to clear and precise information. There's something even a little deeper. Um, Rabbi Meisman, as you know, a student of his, uh, told us many times, and he wrote in his book, that um, the Rishonim, let's say the Rashba, knew all of the Torah. The, the idea that you know something about Torah that he didn't know is inconceivable. Inconceivable. So I asked him, if that's true, how could it be that the Rashba will raise a question and someone else will offer an answer to the Rashba's question? How could someone else offer it? Isn't he saying by implication that he knows something the Rashba didn't know? Otherwise, why didn't the Rashba give that answer? So he said, no, nope, you're making a mistake. That's not the correct that's not the correct analysis. The correct analysis is the Rajba has certain principles that he starts from. He takes those principles and applies them to the problem at hand. Those principles set limits as to what is an acceptable way of handling the problem. When he asks his question, what he's saying is, here are my principles, here's the subject, here's the question I'm asking, and my principles set limits as to the possible answer that could be given. But now let's suppose that Rabbeinu Tam looks at that same issue from the point of view of his starting principles. He doesn't have the same starting principles as the Rashba. Could there very well be that from Rabbeinu's point of view, the question gets a direct answer, which isn't available to the Rashba because he has different principles which limit him in a different way. A lot of learning we've shown him <coughs> is trying to analyze what their fundamental principles are, which explain the positions that they take. So it isn't as if, let's say, if Romaina Tom is trying to answer the question, it isn't as if Romaina Tom would be saying to the Rajpa, I know something you don't know about Torah, that's how I can answer your question. What he's saying is, your principles deny you an answer, and my principles allow me an answer, which doesn't necessarily mean that Romaina Tom's principles are superior. It doesn't mean that. It could be that the question is difficult and, and Rainer Thomas' principles are too lenient and the answer that he gives from the Rosh's point of view is an irresponsible answer. So I'll give you an example of, of how this could apply. Uh, this I learned many, many years ago from my oldest son, from whom also I learned a great many things. In part, being in part of Lech Lecha, Rashi says the following, Lech Lecha, Lech means go, Lecha means roughly to you or yours or something. And Rashi writes, Lech Lecha means You're going for your good and for your benefit. The Ramban objects to Rashi. You think that this construction, a verb and a possessive, means for your good and for your benefit? This type of construction occurs many times in Tanakh. And sometimes it's inconceivable to say something like that. For example, it says in Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs, Hageshem Cholaf Holach Lo. This is speaking about the arrival of spring in the land of Israel, which is the end of the rainy season. The, the rain went, Holach Lo, went for itself. The Lo is a possessive. So Nabhan asked Rashi, what are you going to say? The, the rain left for its good and for its benefit? 
It just means the end of the rainy season. You know, it's not going to rain anymore. So the Ramban says, you can't use that shot. Now, of course, Rashi knew that Pasuk, he wrote a parish on that Pasuk also. <laughs> Rashi made a, a parish on the whole of the Tanakh. So the question is, what did Rashi think he was doing? So I heard a pshat in the name of one of the Akronim, I forget who it was. He points out, if you look carefully in the Rashi, his Dibra Maskil is not Lecho. His Dibra Maskil is Lech Lecho. He's not saying in the verse, Lech Lecho, Lech is a verb, and Lecho is extra, and I'm telling you what the extra word means. That's not what he's doing. What he's saying is, this phrase of a verb and a possessive, this phrase together has a certain meaning. What meaning does it have? Well, the general meaning of the verb and the possessive is that the action that's described by the verb is natural, normal, and expected for the subject performing the action. It's natural, normal, and expected. Oh, so then when you talk about the end of the rainy season, if it fits perfectly, it's the end of the rainy season, the rain goes away, the rain stops. That's halach lo. It went away in the way that's natural for that. What's bothering Rashi is when a Baruch Hu says to Avram Avinu, leave your whole context, your family, your clan, your culture, and go, and doesn't even tell him where he's going, that's not natural. That's not normal. That's not expected. That's the kasha that Rashi is facing. And Rashi says, yes, it is. I'll explain to you why. It's natural and it's normal and it's expected for Avram Avinu. Because as the verse continues, there in the place I'm sending you to, you'll become a goy godel, a great nation. That can't happen to you here. And that is your nature. Your nature is to become a goy godel, and you can't, that can't happen to you here. So the kasha is, the phraseology implies something that's natural, normal, and expected. The context makes it sound like it's not natural, normal, and expected. And Rashi explains in his pshat why it is normal and expected. That's a perfectly consistent way for Rashi to do his pshat. Okay, that sounded to me to be absolutely terrific. So then I asked my oldest son, Nehemiah, but then how do you explain the Ramban? Couldn't the Ramban have thought of that? Couldn't the Ramban have understood that that's what Rashi means? And my son said, Here's one way to understand it. The Ramban thought of it, but he rejected it. And he said, that's not pshat and psukim. Psukim don't do that. That kind of analysis shouldn't be available. It's a mistake to use that kind of analysis. And here you'll have the Ramban coming from his starting principles and Rashi coming from his starting principles. And Rashi's principles make this type of pshat available. And the Ramban says, I don't accept those principles. I think it's a mistake to understand the Torah in that way. That's why I don't credit that way of, of, of analyzing it. So what you're really seeing here is a, a, a clash of fundamental starting principles. And these principles will be subject to what the Ramban said in the Milchamos, that you arrive at them by doing a lot of analysis, a lot of comparison, a lot of evaluation, and developing for yourself the principles by which you come to understand what the Torah is talking about. <clears throat> Another example where um, uh, when it says that Avram Avinu goes to the Akedah and it says that he chopped the wood for the Akedah and they carried it with them to where the, to the mountain. Um, Rashi says, I believe it's a chazal, that you see, Ha'abba Makel Kelis is a shura. Love destroys the normal lines of responsibility and authority. It's not fitting for a man who's the head of a clan of thousands of people to chop wood. He should have one of his servants chop wood. But because of the preciousness of the mitzvah, Ha'abba uh, uh, said, I don't want to give over any part of the mitzvah to anybody else. So he chopped the wood, per, uh, wood personally. <coughs> the Evan Ezra rejects that shot. 
And he says, you're just misreading the verse. The verse says, Avram chopped the wood, Tedalacha, that in the Tanakh, it often will say that A did X, and it will mean that A had X done by others, not that he physically, personally performed the action. And a proof of it is that in Tanakh it says that Solomon built the temple. Now you don't think that Solomon went to Lebanon to cut down the cedars, and Solomon wove the tapestries, and Solomon worked with the gold and the, and the silver and the copper, smelting them into the various forms. Of course not. He had thousands of workers. He had, they had confederates who worked on these things. When it says that he built the temple, what he means is, what it means is he had the temple built by others. That's normal usage in the Tanakh. So, Rashi, when you say, it says that Abraham saddled his donkey, and you want to build a whole shot into it, that he saddled his donkey on, him, on his own to show how much he loved the mitzvah, you're making it up. It says he saddled his donkey. It means he had his servant saddle the donkey, which is a normal thing. You're building a, a castle in the sand. That's what the, the complaint is against Rashi. I heard Pshat in, in Rashi that how he would defend himself against that complaint. He will tell you, um, first of all, your comparison to building the temple is very weak. It's very weak because in the case of the building the temple, to say that Solomon built the temple is nigh unto impossible. It can't be done by one person. When you have words which, taken simplistically, say something that's impossible, then there's very strong reason to say it means something else. It doesn't follow that it means something else everywhere. Where it says it's impossible, something that's impossible, then you have pressure to read it another way. That doesn't give you license to read it another way. Everywhere, I'll give you a comparison. This is my comparison. Um, it says, Adam uh, called his wife's name Chava. Ki hi I saw aim kol chai. She was the mother of all living. Oh, yeah? She was the mother of the squirrels? Okay, okay, we didn't mean squirrels. We meant people. Oh, yeah? She was Adam's mother? She was her own mother? No, of course, we didn't mean Adam. We didn't mean her herself, of course. Don't be silly. That Those things are ridiculous. No, I mean, she was the mother of all the later people who came afterwards. Uh-huh. But that's not what the words say. It just says, Aim kol chai. You say, okay, Aim kol chai. doesn't mean Aim kol chai. It means, uh, you know, reasonably. Can I say, therefore, that when it says that Rivka was the mother of Yaakov and Esau, it doesn't really mean that? It doesn't really mean they were mother. Maybe it just means she, she raised them. Maybe they were, they were adopted children and so forth and so on. No. Because there it describes their birth, and it's one woman being the mother of two children, which is perfectly normal, perfectly natural. There's absolutely no reason whatsoever to say that over there it doesn't mean biological motherhood. So in one place it certainly doesn't mean biological motherhood. But where you're not forced to say that, you don't say it. You say it means what it normally means. So here, too, if it says that Solomon built the temple, and that's, that's nigh unto impossible, and you say he had it done by subordinates, that's quite reasonable. But to say, therefore, that when it says that, yeah, that Avram saddled his donkey, it doesn't mean he saddled his donkey, it means he had it done by subordinates, that's a big jump. Saddling donkey is a one-man job. So there's no reason to use the temple as an example to justify uh, explaining Abraham as if it had it done by others. That's how Rashi will defend himself against that critique. And the second half is, why is the Torah bother telling me this? Well, what do I need to know it for? According to uh, Ebn Ezra, uh, I have to know that he had his, dad saddled, his, his donkey saddled and was saddled by, other, by his servants. Who needs to know that? We don't know what they ate for breakfast. We don't know what he told Sarah he was doing, going off with their son and planning to come back alone. I mean, there are a lot of things missing from the story. The, the commentaries point out he, he, he performed the sacrifice on the third day. What about the night times? There were two night times where he just sat there and thought about what he was doing. 
commentators say, so no one should say he did it in a panic. No one, he, he did it in confusion. What did he think about? What considerations did he have? The Torah doesn't say anything. The Torah leaves out an awful lot. Aha, but yeah, the donkey was saddled. Yeah, that's important. You have to know the donkey was saddled. Rashi is telling me why it tells me that. It tells me about the way in which he performed the mitzvah. That's important. It's a ruchniistic idea. It helps inform how we should do mitzvahs. That makes it into an important thing. So here, according to Rashi's presuppositions, he's not going to be satisfied with saying it was done by, uh, by, uh, um, um, by ser servants. <clears throat> the Rashbam reports, Rashbam was one of Rashi's grandsons, reports that in, in Rashi's old age, he, the Rashbam, fought with Rashi about the process of writing Pshat, and he said, Rashi told him, that if he had time, he would do his commentary over. Now, there are those who are worried about the statement, what it means, and what it implies, and so on and so But, uh, his, in, 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 and there are a number, quite a number of places where Rashi says something, the Rashbam says differently in, in the Pshat and the Torah. Here you see again where <coughs> <coughs> your whole methodology is based on certain guiding principles, and those guiding principles are something that you develop through decades of study, analysis, uh, argument. And by the way, Rashi changes his mind often. And he says so. So it isn't as if, you know, the, the, there's something doctrinaire here. And Rashi quotes his Rebbe so often. And sometimes he says, I quote, he quotes, this is what is my Kabbal for my Rebbe, but I, I can't accept it because it has these and these problems and he gives a different shot. And he's quite open about these things. So, here you have another area which is pervasive to all Torah understanding. It's where the understanding requires, you know, is based on these kinds of ultimate principles. And the ultimate principles are matters of, of judgment. They aren't something that you can establish by articulate argument, precise and detailed. You can't, it can't be established that way. And often, they're not even stated. Often, you have to analyze this. That's why, why an Achronim will analyze Rishonim and say, look, he's coming from this particular standpoint. And that's why he won't accept this pshat, and he will accept that pshat. So again, there's a lot of what's going on which isn't just a matter of book learning. And indeed, strict book learning is a matter of, I would say, equivocal value. The Gemara brings a case, we just had it in the Dafyomi, um, where someone died in Eretz Yisrael, and Reish Lokish gave him a hesped, gave him a, a eulogy, and said this man was an expert in halacha, he learned and knew by heart all of the Tanaitic halachic sources, and gives a list of all the sources, and he was a very great man, and Eretz Yisrael is not the same because they lost such a great person. They said to Rav Nachman in Babylonia, um, perhaps you should give him a hesped here in Babylonia. And he said, what do I have to do that for? What do I have to, to uh, eulogize him for? He was a sack full of books. A sack full of books. So he knew a lot. So what? Could he analyze it? Could he, could he, could he, could he define it? Could he reconcile contradictions in it? Could he create new new applications? No, not worthy of a of a um, of a eulogy. And the Gemara concludes, "Come and see the difference between." Now listen to this language: Hasidei Bavel, the Hasidim of Bavel, versus Takife Eretz Israel, the strong ones of Eretz Israel. And this statement in the Talmud is very subtle. Let's figure this out. Chassid. What's the status of a chassid? Top of the top. That is the most successful level in service of God. We're not talking about people who wear fur hats. And I speak as someone who wears a fur hat. But uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a word from 2,000 years ago where chassid is really the top of the top in service of God. Takif. Takif means someone who's strong. Who's strong, who's positive, who's incisive, who, who works hard, takes responsibility. Takif is a wonderful term of praise. It cannot compare with chassid. It cannot be compared with chassid. 
Now, the Talmud says, come and see the difference between the Hasidim of Babel, the greatest spiritual uh, exemplars of Babylonia versus the strong ones of Israel, strong, strong, not necessarily the top in spiritual attainment, but strong, meaning that even the Hasidim in Babylonia can't compete with the strong ones of Eretz Israel, because in Eretz Israel they did give him a hesped. They did give him a eulogy. They did prize his learning. And Babylonia they didn't. And the Babylonians were wrong. And the ones in Eretz Israel were right. And even the greatest in Babylonia didn't get it. And the ones in Eretz Israel did get it, even the ones who weren't the greatest. What you see here is a difference of attitude between Babylonia and Eretz Israel in learning. The emphasis on analysis, argument, definition, application versus knowledge. In Eretz Israel, they gave very high marks for someone who had a great deal of knowledge. In Babylonia, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't um, appreciate it as much. This is the difference in basic attitude towards learning. And the Talmud here is telling us that the people in Eretz Israel had a certain advantage. So again, this is not something that you, you, know, you learn in principles. And there's another contrasting statement in the Talmud about Babylonian Eretz Israel, which also shows you a, a difference in approach. Um, it says that in, in Babylonia, they fought Milchamta Shel Torah, the war of Torah arguing and debating and uh, challenging, challenging each other. And in, in Eretz Yisrael, they, they treated each other kindly and in a friendly fashion, calmly. That's how they treated them. And the Gemara is clear that the attitude in Eretz Yisrael was superior. I'll bring you two rayas to it. One is, as I'll say, Divrei Chachamim Benachas Nishmoim. The words of the wise are heard with calm, peacefulness, Nachas, not yelling and screaming. I, you'll tell me, but there is the idea of Melcham Teshot Torah, the war of Torah, and it says, Vofim Sufa, uh, that they, 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 they have war at the beginning, but they come to love each other at the end. Um, uh, it does say that, but there's a marsha. They don't often quote this marsha, but it's there anyway. He says, it says, Divre Sofri. It says over there. Um, uh, how's that? be Twico. Um, Suffering. Oh, gosh. Um, I, I hope it will come to me. This Divrei Sofrim, where, where they have the war of Torah, and the Marsha says, Sofrim is Sukbet. Sofrim is level two, not level one. Level one is Chachamim. Chachamim are higher than Sofrim. Sofrim fight Milcham to Shel Torah. But Chachamim, Divrei Chachamim, but Nachas They're heard with calm, with beauty, with, uh, with, uh, uh, pleasure. So when you talk about uh, the, the war of Torah and the fact that, they, that they're, they're fighting in the base Medrash, Mashal says that's level two. It's not level one. And by the way, yeah. let me have a sitter. Is there a sitter there? Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. There's something very interesting in the sitter which I didn't appreciate till I saw it in the Ramchal, um, which I think echoes the same idea in the morning, after Baruch Hu,
We talk about the malachim, the angels, saying, Kodosh, Kodosh, Kodosh. If you pay attention, you'll see there are two very different descriptions. Um, the angels open their mouths with holiness and purity, with shira, which is poetry, zimra, which is music, and they bless and praise, and they sanctify, and they announce that the, king, the fact that God is king, and it says, all of them receive from one another the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, and they give permission to one another to sanctify the, the Creator with nachas ruach, with calm, calm spirit, with a clear speech, ni'ima, pleasantness. Kedusha kulam they all answer in unison, and they say, kodosh, kodosh, kodosh. This is a picture of harmony, mutual respect, mutual accommodation, coordination, and saying together in unity. That's Kodosh Kodosh. Then it says, <coughs> the Ofanim and the Chayas Kodesh, two different types of angels, Berash Godol, with a great noise, a great noise. We didn't have a great noise before. It was pleasant, calm, inviting one another, music, not great noise. No, here's a great noise. They come up opposite the Srafim, and then they say, There's two very different descriptions. In Kedusha, in, in, in Shemun Esri, he said the same thing, this Rash Godel. Now, I got tipped off to this because the Ramchal, in one of his forum, says Rash Godel is a symptom of Golos. Symptom of Golos. Now, Kodosh, Kodosh, Kodosh are words in the book of Isaiah. Chazal say, Yeshayo, who gave his prophecy in the land of Israel, is like someone who lives in the palace of the king, I'm sorry, in the capital of the king, sees the king often, sees the palace often, and he's used to it. Used to it, and he's, he's calm and content with it, and he accepts it and deals with it in a very mature and, and sophisticated way. Echezko lived in, in Babylonia, and he was seeing it in exile. And in exile, first of all, if you have such a vision, it's a shock, considering where you are. Something that happens rarely. And you, 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 it, it's hard to take. It's hard to assimilate. It's hard to, to accept. And there's shock and there's confusion. Right? So they're two very different ways to perceive Kodesh Baruch Hu's greatness and to respond to it. These, these are situational. But you have to know, it's not as if one's right and one's wrong. It's not as if one's better and one's worse. There are two different ways to receive this particular divine vision and to articulate it. And it's going to be different. So all of this is built into Torah understanding and to, into Torah practice which means that you're, you're going to have a variety of ways of organizing and assimilating and, and, and applying things, and it's going to be dependent upon this nonverbal understanding. Not everything can be traced to a clear and precise argument. Maral says, why were there 71 people in the Sanhedrin? 71 people. If you think of the Sanhedrin as a court, Trying cases, I don't think anywhere else in the world you have a court of 71 people listening to a case, listening to witnesses, and discussing, and debating, and then finally posculating what the outcome should be for the litigants. They did function as a legislature also. For that, you certainly have bodies that big and bigger, but not for as a court. Maral says, 
different people have different understandings. And in order to have as good an approximation to the truth as possible, you should have a wide variety of people engaged in the discussion. So you have a wide variety of points of view. And then, through that discussion, you'll come at something which is a better approximation of the truth than the, if it was done otherwise. Um, which means that there are going to be differences of this kind. Now let me add in something. This is a footnote. This is just a historical curiosity. But it shows you that people, even Havel, non-Jews, can appreciate these things. Have you heard of what the medieval times were called the court jester? <coughs> okay, so people think that his job was to make jokes. You know, it's very difficult and tense being king. Time to time you need to relax. It's like entertainment. That's wrong. That was not his job at all. The function of the court jester was to bring critique of the king's policy to the king. But you couldn't criticize the king, especially if there was divine right of kings. You can't oppose the king. You can't imply the king doesn't know anything. You can't, something. You can't, you can't criticize the king in any way, shape, or form. But he's not criticizing, he's just telling jokes. They're just jokes. Every day is Purim, right? And in the jokes, he inserts the critiques that the king needs to hear. That's very clever. They too realize that you have a dilemma. You don't want to infringe on the honor and the authority of the king at all. On the other hand, you want him to be able to receive critique that he has to hear so he can make better decisions. So, when it comes to you know, understanding and applying Torah, there is a question of this kind of, of evaluation. Now, for example, I'll give you a modern example. Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zechazar Gavracha, was famous for being very machmir on Shabbos. He said, I have heard it said in his name, that he said, what's going to save the American Jewish community is Shabbos. And therefore, no compromises vis-a-vis -vis Shabbos can be made. And here's one of the examples that he had. When he came to America, there was something called the early Shabbos Minion. 7 a.m. Shabbos Minion. Why would anybody get up at 6.30 to be in shul 7 a.m. Shabbos morning? The answer is because by 9 o'clock he had to be at work. So they had early minyanim, so people could daven in shul on Shabbos before they went to work, because they did go to work on Shabbos. And Rav Moshe said, no, out with them, no early minyanim. Make it an absolute choice, no compromise. None of this, yeah, I keep Shabbos sort of, because I do go to minyan. I get up early, listen, I get up early, this is not, not push it. I do go to work and I do malacha when I do when I work, but at least I go to minion. No, it has to be a stark choice. Either you are doing Shabbos or you're not doing Shabbos. That's oh, that's a decision like the decision of not blowing shofar on Rosh Hashanah. There's no strict issue in having an early minion on Shabbos morning. You do have to dive in Shabbos morning. A natural attitude would be a mitzvah, a mitzvah, and a veyr, and a veyr. Let him do the mitzvah that he can. I mean, and, and the various that he does are, are separate cheshbon. But Moshe said, no. In 20th century America, that's not right. That's not the way it should be done. This is not something that you can prove by a case-by-case by a -case analysis. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a judgment that this is the right way in, to, approach, to approach the, um, the um, situation that, that, that you're dealing with. So Hasidus made use of this idea <coughs> openly and explicitly. What I'm telling you is that everybody else is making use of the idea because it's inescapable. They didn't publicize it. They didn't openly discuss it. But um, it, 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 it's definitely there. And I'll finish with one, one analysis of Rabbi Hanan Vassaman, which uh, uses this type of idea in a very unexpected way and in a very fundamental way. You probably have heard that minors, girls before the age of 12 and boys before the age of 13, 
are not obligated to mitzvot. That's not uh, completely agreed upon. Some say they have no obligation, mitzvot don't apply to them. Others say that they're not penalized for failure. Onus Rachmana Patre means that since you're not responsible for what you're doing, you don't get punished for what you do. But obligation there is. Of course, it will be commensurate with intelligence, but 11-year-olds can be very intelligent. And they could easily do many, many, many mitzvahs. And according to this position, the 11-year-old is responsible to do the mitzvahs. Just that if he fails... There's no penalty, no punishment. So the question would be, um, how does he get to be responsible? Where does the responsibility come from? Now, normally, the Rabbanan have authority to make mitzvahs. And it seems that the obligations that the, rab that the, the child has will be rabbinic. They won't be... They won't be uh, biblical. But the problem is this. You would say uh, there are rabbinic mitzvahs. How do rabbinic mitzvahs become binding on a Jew? Well, there are two famous verses in the Torah. One is, Don't turn aside from what they tell you right or left. And the other is, You have to do what you do according to the Torah that they teach you. One is a losase, one is an ase. These are verses that tell you you must do what the rabbis tell you. Aha! Okay, so the Torah, written by God, says, do what the rabbis tell you. And the rabbis say to do X, so I have to do X. Okay, I got that, but the verses only apply to adults. They don't apply to children. So this would not give leverage to the rabbis to tell the children what to do. How do you tell the children what to do? Rechana Wasserman, in an essay called, a series of essays called Divrei Sofer, says, the rabbis know the Torah. The Torah is God's will for how the world should run. They're the ones who best know what God wants for the world. And they said, God wants the children to do these mitzvahs. That's the authority. The authority is they know what God wants. They know it because they mastered the Torah and they understand it. Not because it's written in a verse in the Torah. Not because it's in a Mishnah or a Brisa. Not because a Bayan Rava said so. They know the whole Torah and they know that that's what God wants. That's a gigantic statement. That on the basis of that, he says that the rabbinic responsibility of non-adults, of pre-adults, pre to do what they do is on the basis of that kind of rabbinic judgment. That shows you that this whole area is, is based on this kind of judgment, this kind of understanding. Um, it's a very, very fundamental part of, uh, of, uh, of all Torah practice and understanding. And Lahav, though, this is a point that was, was made explicit in the second half of the 20th century in philosophy and in science. There's a great deal of what's called intuition that runs the most fundamental uh, areas of, uh, of human thought uh, and where when push comes to shove, what you're told is, that's the way we see it. That's the way we see it, that's the way we understand it, that's the way we analyze it, these are the ideas that we use, there's a whole discussion of beauty in scientific theories. Really? Beauty? You mean they're painted in chartreuse? Well, no, not exactly. They sort of, I don't know, they sort of have intellectual beauty, sort of. And, you know, if they have that, then they're serious theories. And if they don't, they don't. Oh, yeah? Could you define beauty for me, sir scientist? It's, no, I'm really, I can't. I sort of know when I see it, you know. <laughs> we can tell when a theory is beautiful and when it isn't beautiful. This is what it's based on? Yeah, this is what it's based on. In the sense that it's got to be like that, because, you know, it's beautiful, and nature is beautiful, and that's the way it is. <laughs> and, and this is taken very seriously. Um, I wrote my PhD thesis on a certain 
theorem in mathematical logic, the theorem of Kurt Gödel, people who are great mathematicians, they think about a problem, and they think, hmm, wow, this and this and that and that. I'll bet if you tried it like this, you could get a solution. Now, when they say that, because they're great mathematicians, they get it right, let's say, 60% of the time. When I say that, I never get it right. Never. Because I'm not a great mathematician. What's he doing? He says, ah, it's like this and this. Mm, I'll bet that. What do you mean, I'll bet that? Why did you say that? What's your method? What rules are you using? Method? Rules? I think about it. And then it seems clear to me that this is the way to go. And experience has taught me when I have that feeling 60% of the time, I come up with a proof. That's why they pay me to do mathematics. There's no method there. There are no rules there. He just thinks about it and then he sort of sees the path ahead and then he follows it and he gets his proof. So mathematics is based on this kind of intuition. So is physical science. When you have a, a theory and an experiment that violates the theory and something's wrong to figure out what to do, some people think and say, uh, yeah, I think this is what we should do. And then they do it and then it works. There's no rules for that. It's not based on any principle. It's just they think about it and then it seems to them and then when they do the thinking, very, very often it works. So this idea of intuition is ubiquitous. It's used all the time. Some people, this is also true in the cultural wars, you know, men make fun of women by saying, ah, she's just, just used, you know, basing on intuition. What a terrible philosophical mistake. Intuition is everywhere. No one escapes intuition. If you didn't use intuition, you'd be paralyzed. You'd be intellectually paralyzed. Only you should check to see that your intuition is borne out by experience. But to analyze it and prove that it's, that it's right, and give it statistics and so on and so on, everything relies ultimately on intuition. And that's, it's recognizing that it's a very, very important aspect of understanding Torah. When I was growing up uh, in America, in a non-religious context, I was taught something which sounded so clever. I was so happy with it until I thought about it. Ours is a rule of law, not a rule of persons. We have laws. The laws are applied to everybody equally and objectively as against a monarchy or a, or a nobility where people do as they please and make up the rules as they go along and so forth and so on. That is a very subtle half-truth because laws have to be interpreted in order to be applied. And interpretation is, a, is, a, is, a, is an intellectual matter of judgment. And people disagree how it should be interpreted and how it should be applied. So it's not only mathematics. The constitutional battles, the Supreme Court going back and forth. Is this constitutional? Isn't it constitutional? The laws themselves need human interpretation. Eric and Morris about this as well. I'll tell you one Gemara and then I'll quit. I'll show you how philosophy hides behind what seems to be trivial. A non-Jew came to Hillel and said to him, I want to learn your Torah, but only the written. I'm not interested in the oral. I don't trust it, I don't believe in it, just the written. So Hillel said, fine, let's start with the Aleph base. First day he taught him Aleph Beis Gimel Dalet. He said, make sure you're going to by tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll have a second lesson. Comes back to my, for the next, next day and Hill says, let's review. What letter is this? Points to the Aleph. And the guy says, Aleph. He says, no, that's Dalet. What letter is this? Points to the base. The guy says, that's base. Says, no, it's Gimel. So the, the guy says, excuse me, <laughs> it's only four letters. <laughs> I remember what you told me yesterday. Oh, you remember what I told you yesterday? In other words, I have to tell you, tell you Balper, tell you orally what the letters are. So your project of learning the written without the oral is impossible. Philosophically impossible. The written is what oral speakers say it is. If there aren't any oral speakers, then it has no content at all. You can't have written without oral. It's not possible. It's not philosophically, content, there's no content. That's a deep, deep idea. And interpretation has these 
principles of evaluation and judgment built in.